So I was thinking about the, 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 the season that we're in, and uh, I was thinking about church life and how different it kind of is, um, and how um, there, there's a few people in here that have been with us for a very long time. Uh, Matt's been here with us for a very long time. Rob, uh, my wife, she's been with me for a very long time. Praise God, Caleb. But there's a lot of there's a lot of guys that have been with us. And I was thinking about it this this uh, afternoon when I was getting ready to to come in for the study. And I thought, if, of all of the history of this little church meeting in this little building, we've never been closed down like this ever. And I mean, it's probably the same for all the churches, but I just was thinking about it going, man, this is, this is crazy, and we want to be safe, absolutely, we want to care for one another with love, absolutely, we want to, we want to um, uh, you know, operate in grace and mercy towards people, and we want to think of others, you know, I think, uh, you know, you guys that are, that are masking up and suiting up for everything, and uh, I just think, I think it's good, I think it's a courtesy um, but it's just craziness. Um, and when I think of a season like this, I, I think of the words of David. I see you guys here tonight, and I think of the words of David from Psalm 27. In Psalm 27, David said, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek. One thing I desire, one thing I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And there's kind of a reason for it, he says here. To behold the beauty of the Lord. I want to go to the house of the Lord because that's where I'm going to meet God. That's where I'm going to hear what God has to say to me. That's where I'm going to see his beauty. And it says there at the very end of, of this little section, and to inquire of his temple. He went there to meet with the Lord. That's why he wanted to be there so bad. He, I mean, this is like kind of a, a little bit of a summation of his thought process. There's one thing I want. Really, when I think of David, I think this is what makes him a king, a man after God's own heart. Because a lot of the other kings, they wanted a lot of things. They wanted good things for Israel. Some wanted good things for themselves and not for Israel. They didn't really care about Israel. But one thing that we see that David is different than so many other kings is he wanted to be in the presence of God more than anything else. That's what he wanted. And that's what, do you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? This is it. This is, what, this is what made David different from all the other kings, man. He wanted to be in the house of God. He wanted to seek God because he knew that in God's presence, and, 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 and to be in God's presence for David, it wasn't about the building. Remember, when David was king, there wasn't a building. There was a holy tent like the Cots guys have. <laughs> There wasn't a building, though. There wasn't a temple. There was just a tabernacle. There was just a tent. So it wasn't about the building of God. It was about the God of the building. And that's what David was seeking. And we know that because we can look in, in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, which kind of tells us what would happen if we go. In Psalm, did I say Psalm? Yeah. Okay, good. I thought I said John. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life. And here it, here it is here. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David knew something about coming to the house of God. He knew that all those things in the world and all the things that pull and draw us and say, this is the best thing, you'll be happy if you do this, or if you don't know why you're not satisfied, try this lifestyle, or whatever it is. He knew that all of those things fade away, and if you really want peace and joy in your life, you need the presence of God. If you really want pleasure, pleasure forevermore, Joy and pleasure, those two things, I mean, people seek for those. They seek to be happy, which joy is really a deeper happiness, and they seek for pleasure. A lot of people seek for those things to satisfy themselves. You're going to seek in the world, you're going to come up dry. Remember what I said on Sunday? I think it, maybe it was only first service. 
if you weren't here on first service, I'll remind you. The things in the world, they look so big and so inviting and so rich, but they're broad and they're shallow. And the things of God, they might look small and like that could never satisfy my life, but they're deep, but they're rich. And God's word is true. And we're going to see some of that tonight in the story, in the life of David, in the life of Solomon, as we get into and move on with. So let me just sum up that whole thought really quickly. David knew that satisfaction like nowhere else comes from God. Can't get anywhere else. Satisfaction, pleasure, satisfaction. Those are the things that the world is seeking. Just saying. They want pleasure. They want satisfaction. David knew it was from the presence of God. Okay, so grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. We're picking up in 1 Kings, um, and we're starting a new book in the Bible. This is our first chapter and first verse of 1 Kings. So we're starting this out. Um, and this, this book of Kings wasn't originally divided into 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It was just one big book of Kings. Um, and really, there's not too much of a big introduction or a special introduction into the book of 1 Kings. It's just all it is is a continuation of the history of the nation of Israel, right? So if you think about it, Kings... We started in Samuel with the with basically toward the end of 1 Samuel with the first king ever. What was his name? Saul. That's right. So Saul was the first king of Israel. And then the next king to come was Saul was David's choice. I mean, pff, the people's choice. I just gave it away. <laughs> Man. So anyways, you guys already know. The next king was David. Right. So the next king was David. And so now that's the beginning. Does anybody know? Um, what the book was before 1 Samuel? Judges, right? So they had judges before they had kings, and now they wanted kings because they wanted to be like the world who had kings instead of having God as their ruler, God as their king, which is what we want in our lives, God as our ruler and our king. And so they went on to have kings. So we have the first two kings in the books of Samuel, and now we start on with the continuation. We're going to start on this, this evening with the third king, and then the kings just proceed and we go through, which really is an awesome, interesting, it's not just kings. We're going to get into some amazing prophets of the Lord and some, just some awesome stuff ahead of us as we go through first and second kings, but it just, all it is is a continuation. So there's not some big elaborate um, um, introduction for kings. It really continues on. One of the commentaries I went through said, some of the really old Bibles that he had looked at before, which I haven't seen one, I don't think this old. First and second Samuel was named, it was one book and it was named first kings. And then first and second kings was one book named second kings which to my little mind makes a lot more sense than all of the divisions that we have in there because that's exactly what's going on. Um, but so yeah, we're going to look through a bunch of kings, a bunch of prophets, um, and we're going to actually, it's, it covers about 500 years of the nation, of the history of the nation of Israel. We're going we're gonna to cover the division of the northern and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom is called Israel. Southern kingdom is called Judah, good. And their captivity is going to go into Babylon. Um, they're going to be captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. But anyways, we're going to see a whole lot of stuff as we move through. So let's start. Let's look at 1 King, Kings chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, now, wait a minute. Does anybody need a Bible? If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. We got some Bibles in the back so you can follow along. Okay, everybody's good? Great. Perfect. So, I have some old water from last week. Somebody got me new water? Thank you, guys. I'm sorry I doubted. Okay. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, 1 Kings. Now, King David was old and advanced in years. And they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. You guys ever been there? 
How many people? Just me? Okay. All right, cool. For a minute, I'm like, what? You guys are a bunch of warm-blooded people. Okay, I, I don't know what it is, man. My, t- so today I was warm. I was warm, doing great all day. And then like in this afternoon, the AC kept kicking on and my fingers are still cold. So anyways, I, I kind of get the cold-blooded stuff. But David is in this place where he's older in his years. And he's pretty old here in verse 1 of Kings. Of First Kings, he's about 70 years old. So he's about 70 years old, which is pretty old, but I mean, it's not like super duper old, right? 70 years old, pretty old. Uh, and the reason I kind of say not super duper old, you know how old Moses was when he started his ministry? 80 years old. Now, could you imagine that? Starting your ministry at 80 years old? Man, I got a lot more training to do before I start. 80 years old, and you know how old uh, Moses was when he died? 120 years old. How about Abraham? Anybody know how old Abraham was when he died? What? That was, that was, that was a good guess. She's thinking way early uh, before. She said, did you say 600? He's, he, he died at about 175 years old. And Isaac, anybody know how old Isaac was when he died? Oh, no. No, that's how old Isaac was when the rapture happened. Yeah. Woo! All right, we got some good stuff. We got some quick people going on here tonight. Okay, I'm sorry. Isaac was 180 years old when he died. Oh, man. See, that's what happens when you do interactive studies here. Oh, God. Okay, so anyways, back to the thing. David's 70. He's cold. He's in bed. It doesn't matter how many blankets they put on him. He's cold. And then I will say this about David. David has lived a very full and active life. I think David's life is probably more, more difficult physically and probably especially uh, emotionally, stressfully than a lot of our lives, right? David, if you think he was a man of war, he was in a lot of battles. He probably took a lot of, you know, knocks, a lot of beatings, um, he, he, for many years, many years, he was on the run from hiding from his king, right? In, in, in that time in, in history, he's hiding in caves. He was running all over the land of Israel away from his own uh, king. And so many years, I can't imagine living in the stress of if he catches me. I mean, it's not like if he catches me, oh man, I have to pay him back 20 bucks. It's like you're dead, right? It's it's a big deal. So there's a lot of stress that happens there. Um, and, then, and then also in that one season of his life, you remember he defected and he went and he, it, Saul was chasing him, but he went and he lived in Philistine territory, the number one enemy. Talk about watching your back. The number one enemy of the children of Israel, he lived in their land. Uh, and, and then also, I mean, you think about the, the horrible sin in his life and the stress that that caused. He ended up murdering somebody because he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And you remember all this stuff? And so he's got all this sinful stress. Then his, his firstborn son with her died. Uh, and then after that, you know, the, the, there was a curse on his life because he disobeyed the commands of God. And, and then in the end of his life, before all this stuff, man, he had some major problems with his kids. Major problem, and a lot, I, I would have to say like 98% of it was his own fault. He didn't father very well, he didn't parent very well, and he had a whole, a whole lot of problems, but it was also part of what God was doing with his discipline in his life. But I mean, you can kind of track that back all the way back to his sin with Bathsheba. Anyways, that's kind of a whole other Bible study. I, I, I'm just saying like he... He has had a very difficult life. Uh, Absalom, you guys remember Absalom? He defected and all of Israel went with him against David. That's stressful. That's burdensome. All that to say, 70 years is a good life for David, right? He's, he's, he's getting older. And in verse 1, he's old, he's worn out, and he's cold. So this section, these first four verses, are going to depict David as a frail old man, Okay. Verse 2, therefore, his servant said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought 
for our Lord the King, and let her stand before the King, and let her care for him, and let her lie in your bosom, that our Lord the King may be warm. So, his servants see him cold in his room, and they get this idea, it would be a good thing for us to get him a young woman to lay in bed with him to keep him warm. Now, before you go on, because right off the bat you think, this is a bad idea. Anybody thinking this? Yeah. You're thinking, this is a man of God. This is a bad idea, right off the bat. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things before we kind of move on. Josephus, who is a, a historian, uh, mentioned that these servants there in verse 2, that were the ones that came up with the idea, these servants, he calls them physicians. That these were David's, basically, his medical, personal medical guys. And they're like, man, we got to warm David up. And so the, the second thing that Josephus mentions is that this was actually like a prescribed medical treatment in that culture, in that day and age. It was something they actually would do. So we have David here. He's weak, he's cold. We're going to see that he, later on in the text, he's confined to his room. He's freezing cold. There's no central AC and heating, right? No central air conditioning and cooling, or that's, anyways, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's no outlet in his room to plug in an electric heater. There's no such thing as electric blankets. I mean, it's like, anybody ever seen the Flintstones? <laughs> he's sleeping on bedrock. No, I'm just kidding. He's probably not sleeping on bedrock. But he's cold, and he can't get warm. And so his personal health care team prescribed him one prescription for a young virgin woman. Um, okay, one of the other thoughts that comes to mind right off the bat is, I don't know if you guys know up to this far point in the story, but David has got ten wives. Why don't you lay with one of your wives, David? Right? You've already got wives. Why don't you weigh, uh, lay with one of your wives? Why does it have to be a young woman, a young virgin? Okay. Well, his older wives could actually kill him because of their cold feet. I'm just saying, if you're cold already and your wife puts those cold feet on your side, whew. okay, now that's sort of a joke. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's sort of a joke. It's sort of not a joke. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, I don't. Okay. I don't know where I want to go. Okay. So. Okay. So he, they give him. They give him. Um, they give him this prescription of a virgin. Now, let me, let me just say this. Okay, so in that culture, in that day and age, they, they gave, they prescribed him a virgin. Now, why wouldn't they prescribe him uh, someone who wasn't a virgin? Well, in that day and age, kind of like contrary to our culture, if you weren't a virgin, 99.9% .9 sure you were married, right, to somebody else. So, of course, a virgin just means a young a young woman, and of course, younger is going to have more warmth, more, more of that energy still going. Uh, <laughs> just, just warmth. Okay, let, really quickly, before we get too far ahead of ourselves with anything, let's look at the very end of verse 4. But the king did not know her. That means there was nothing, no hanky-panky. She was just doing what she was doing. The king did not know her. Okay, now one more thing really quickly here. Um, a, a lot of commentaries think that at this point he married this young woman as a concubine. Now you guys know what a concubine was. It wasn't a legitimate, like it wasn't a wife-wife, but it was at the same time a legal like wife document type of thing in that culture. The biggest difference between a wife and a concubine was that a wife didn't get to or, I'm sorry, a concubine didn't get part of the inheritance. They were, they were more like a, a wife slave, which is not a good thing, okay? Just not a good thing. We don't have wife slaves. If you do have a wife slave, 
come and talk to me and I'll tell you about what you should do. You should serve your wife and lay your life down for her. Okay. There's a few more things I wanted to mention. Verse 3, let's keep going. So, they sought for a lovely young woman through all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. Verse 4, the young woman was very lovely and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. So basically, they went out and they found David a pretty new heater for his... That's a joke, not a good joke. And she cared for him, and she took, notice there, she cared for him. She took care of him. Um, so she, she was like kind of like a nurse. I mean, really, she, she was kind of like a nurse. Um, and at the end here of verse 4, like I said, the king did not know her. This is Old Testament did not know her. That means there was no relationship. He was not intimate with her. Um, she, she was really strictly a helper. Verse 5, and then... Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. He will prepare for himself chariots, I'm sorry, and he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and, and 50 men to run before him. So then next on the scene, we have Adonijah. Now, I just want to remind you really quickly, that whole first part that we went through, the first four verses, really a lot of it was to de depict how frail David was during this time as his reign as king. And so what happens? We get Adonijah. Who's Adonijah? He was the fourth oldest son of King David, one of David's sons. Um, the oldest, he's the oldest at this time because his other two older brothers, they've both been killed. There was another brother um, that is mentioned only when he's born and then never mentioned again. A lot of people just think, well, he probably died uh, or maybe he just couldn't be the king. Anyways, he, the next in line is Adonijah. And so he, go, he, he just, what does he do? He does something here that we probably should not do. Let me just say, uh, guaranteed we shouldn't do in verse five. What does it say that he did? He exalted who? Himself. He exalted himself. Which is the opposite of what we are to do, right? It's the opposite of what we as Christians are to do. And when I think about exalting yourself, there are so many verses that you could quote about exalting yourself. I think of take heed when you think you stand lest you fall, right? I think of the parable that Jesus told of the guy that wanted to sit at the head of the table. And then when the guy came in that was like the master of the dinner, he took him and said, why do you sit here? Put him at the foot of the table. Remember the story that Jesus said? He said, when you go get a seat, sit at the foot of the table, and then you'll be moved up into a place of honor. But don't exalt yourself. But the one that I really thought of that really popped in my head when I was going through this study was James chapter 4, verse 10, which says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's what we want. We want to be humble. We want to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And we want God to be the one to lift us up. When we lift ourselves up, there can be and will be most oftentimes a fall or trouble involved. We're going to see that very clearly in the text with Adonijah. There is a danger in exalting yourself because you'll probably be, probably be ended up... Anyways, you'll probably end up being humbled by God. And that sometimes... Anybody ever been in here been humbled by God? Which one's better, being humbled by God or humbling yourself? Usually being humbled by God means he's teaching you a lesson. That hurts. Okay, so, yes, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Now, the, the other thing that happened, might happen to you instead of being, uh, you know, other than being humbled by God is you might end up, you might end up living your life outside of God's plan for your life which isn't a good thing either. In fact, I think it's worse. I'd rather be, in fact, I pray, if you go outside of God's plan for your life, I pray he humbles you big time and you come back. 
That, that's what we want. We want to be in God's will for our life. And being humbled and being back where God wants is always better because God's plan for your life will always turn out better than your plan for your life. I mean, guaranteed, God's plan is better. I mean, when God thinks of you, he thinks of your future, your eternity. When you think of you, you're often thinking like me now. That's it. Me now. Nothing else. God doesn't do that. His plan is better. So I would encourage you, young people in here, middle-aged people in here, old people in here, pray for God's plan. Seek God's plan, his will for your life. Amen? Okay. So what we're going to see here, though, is we're going to see him do his plan, and then he's going to get in, in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, but he ends up doing the same thing that his brother did, his brother Absalom did. If you flip back and look in Absalom's life, what did he do when he wanted to take over? Well, he assembled these chariots and these horsemen and basically got together his uh, military entourage that wasn't authorized by the current king, but he got it together anyways to take it on out in public to show everybody, look guys, here I come. I'm coming up as the king. So he just went ahead and uh, did whatever he wanted to do to try to persuade the people that he was legit, but he wasn't legit, so he should have quit. Now that, I don't know if, I don't know what age group you're in. <laughs> okay, verse six. <laughs> Let's keep going. And his father had not rebuked him at any time. Okay, this is Adonijah. This is the son. Verse six, we're getting some new information. David had not rebuked him at any time saying, what have you done so? Or why have you done so? He was also very good looking. And his mother had borne him after Absalom. So the first thing we see in verse 6 is David, David really, he, he hadn't been a good father to him. He hadn't rebuked him. He never got in trouble. He never got in trouble, so he became a spoiled brat. I remember having those conversations with my kids. I'm telling you, I'm disciplining you because I don't want you to turn out to be a spoiled brat. And then they have a little five-year-old sitting there and go, what's a spoiled brat? <gasps> it's somebody really that only thinks about themselves and wants everything given to them. And man, it's not a good thing. Spoiled brats, not a good thing. Uh, watch Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. There's a girl in there. <laughs> uh, anyways, so... There, so he, now David hasn't been a good father. Now let me just say this disclaimer. I don't want to go into like psychology or, or that kind of stuff, but there could be a reason. And, and one of the reasons I would say, or something that we can kind of get a hint of from the text, is that David's father might not have been that great of a father to him. And the first thing that comes to mind is when we meet David, you guys remember the scene? Samuel comes to anoint the next king. And, and what does Jesse do? Jesse brings all of his sons. And Samuel goes through and God says, not that one. That one looks good on the outside, but I see the inside. Remember that? And he, uh, next, next, next. And finally Samuel goes, do you have any more kids? And he's like, oh, I got the one out in the field tending the sheep. And he brings the little scrawny sheep tender kid in who has the heart of gold, who has a heart after the, the, the Lord and who's going to be the next king of Israel. So we see that's kind of a weird little dynamic to their relationship. The second reason that I kind of would say that is David wrote a whole lot of Psalms, a whole bunch, and we never see his dad mentioned once in the Psalms. But we do see his mom mentioned twice. And David refers to his mother as the maidservant of the Lord. It seems like his mom was a godly influence in his life. And his dad wanted him to keep track of the sheep out in the field. So it's just an interesting thing uh, to, to just kind of say, well, maybe David had it rough, but I, let me just say this as well. No matter what kind of childhood, no matter what kind of father you have, you have a better heavenly father and you have a great example. And don't let those things be an excuse. Don't let those things be an excuse. Don't let a, a father who left and is absent be an excuse for bad behavior. Don't do that. You have a, a father that loves you and gives 
He would give anything for you. In fact, he loved you so much, he gave his most precious thing, his only son, to die for our sins. Amen? Okay, and, and the second thing that we had really see was going against Adonijah is he was good looking. You might go, what? That's a good thing. Oh, man, I don't know. That could get you in a whole lot of trouble. And Adonijah seems to be the guy, the kind of guy that, like, knows he's good looking, right? Like, yeah, that's what's up. Anyways, I don't know. Okay. Verse 7. Then he, he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. So he brought his plan to a couple of people. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoadiah, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. So he got a few more. He gets together a couple more key people that were leadership that he believes will go along with him. He kind of doesn't announce it to everybody. He, he kind of hand selects a few people to go on his campaign, right? Because he knows there's a, a lot of people that are going, what are you talking about? That would be loyal um, to David. And of all the people, uh, is there anybody in that list that you see that you go, what? Yeah, Joab. Joab. Joab is a crazy guy. He's, the more we get to know him, I think the more, he's just kind of unpredictable. He's, he's, he's loyal to David, but then so often David will tell him to do something and he doesn't do it. He does something totally opposite, but he kind of has the attitude, well, I'm thinking of David's best, and so that's why I killed his son that he told me not to kill. You know, this kind of stuff. And, and also, then David fires him, and he kills the captain of the army to get his own position back. Like, there's so many things that are really whacked out about Joseph, uh, Joab, but Joab, one thing, man, he would give his life for the king. Like, he was a man's man in the, in the sense that I'm going to fight for David, so it's just, it's weird. But, um, but Joab, he goes ahead and he goes along with what's going on here. And uh, so anyways, it says there in, in verse 8, but there's a bunch of people that are totally loyal to what David says. Verse 9, and Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fatted cattle by the stone of Zohilath, which is in, in Rogel. And he also invited all his brothers, the king's son, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the, uh, the mighty men, the whole list of mighty men, of David's mighty men, or one brother, that is Solomon. I think the reason that he's not inviting Solomon, you probably already figured this out, he already knows, excuse me, I'm getting hiccups, I think. He already knows that Solomon should be the king. And so he leaves Solomon out. So basically what we see here in, in, um, in verse 9 is Adonijah throws himself an I'm becoming the king party. Just a little note here. You can't throw yourself an I'm becoming the king party. <laughs> That's not how it works. The current king has to throw you that you're becoming the king party, right? You can't, just, you can't just do that. You can't show up at high school as a freshman and go, I'm a senior. Sorry, you're a freshman. So, so here's what Adonijah is trying to do. Um, and, <clears throat> and so he, but he comes up, though, and he has a pretty legit thing. He has a barbecue. He has offerings that would have uh, been a normal part of somebody becoming a king. And he invites all these other men of Judah, um, again, except the people loyal to David. Verse 11, so Nathan spoke to Bathsheba. So Nathan's the prophet loyal to David. He goes to Bathsheba, the mother of who? Solomon, saying, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? Before we move on, isn't that a horrible name? Haggith. That name stinketh, I'm just saying. And David, our Lord, he says, does not know it. So this is happening. David doesn't know it. Nathan's telling Bathsheba, verse 12, Come, please, let me now give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. 
really quickly. This is something that's pretty important because when a new king would come in and set up his kingdom, oftentimes, what would they do to the people that would threaten their kingdom? They'd kill them. Absolutely. So that's what, uh, that's what verse 12 is about. Um, he's saying, look, man, uh, you need to save your life. And this might save the life of you and your son. Verse 13, so go immediately to King David and say to him, did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become, become king? Verse 14, Then, while you are still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words, because this basically is bringing an accusation to the king of one of his sons. Um... But we see a little bit of information in there. David, and it seems like if, if Bathsheba knew, then the family of David knew that David had Solomon in line for the next king. So we, we catch some information right there. And so verse 15, so what happened, Bathsheba, Bathsheba, she went into the chamber to the king, and now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shulamite was serving the king. So he was really cold. He had his warming blanket. Verse 16, And Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king. And the king said, What is your wish? And then she said to him, My lord, you swore by the Lord your God your maid serv to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now look, Adonijah has become king, and now my lord the king you do not know about it. He has sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon your servant he has not invited. Verse 20, And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise, it will happen when my lord the king rests with his fathers, that means kicks the bucket, then I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. So she goes in, tells them what Nathan told her to say. Verse 22, and just then, while she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And so they told the king, saying, here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, my lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me? And, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's son and the commanders of the army and Abiathar the priest. And look, they are eating and drinking before him. And they, and they say, long live Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Benaniah, the son of Jehoiadiah, nor your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done by, by my lord the king, and you have not told your servant who should sit on the throne, my lord the king, after him? So he kind of tells them the story, and I like right there at the end, he asks him, like, so is this something you did and didn't tell anybody else about? And David's like, what? Like his ears are perking up, right? That was kind of a setup there by Nathan just to get him, just to get David on edge a little bit. David needed some warm blood flowing. So I think that this is part of what's working uh, for David because he kind of comes back in and he just starts shooting answers. He just starts shooting things that need to be done. So uh, verse 28, and then King David answered and call, uh, and said, call Bathsheba to me. So Bathsheba Obviously, had, when Nathan came in, had left the room um, out of kind of respect for their conversation. Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath and said, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore it to you by the Lord God of Israel, 
saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So certainly I will do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and paid homage to the king and said, Let my lord, King David, live forever. Which is obviously he's not going to live forever. He's just getting old. He's about to die. Just thought I'd give you that information. Verse 32. And King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Jehoadiah. So he calls these three really loyal guys, calls them, come in, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoadiah. And so they came before the king, verse 33, and the king also said to them, take with you the servant of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my mule and take him down to Gihon. And there let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. And then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne, and he shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be the ruler over Israel and Judah. So we get this interesting stuff. Um, they, they basically, they, they, they come, David says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get Solomon, I want you to get these three guys, and I want you to, and did you notice there, in what verse is it? It's in verse 33. It says, have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule. Now, this was important because this was a sign when he came riding in through into Jerusalem for this appointing, the people would have noticed David's mule. It was the sport edition. <laughs> and I know that's kind of funny, but the, the thing is, like, that's really true. In, in their law, it, was, it wasn't, uh, like, a lawful thing for them to breed a horse and a donkey. I don't know if you know that, but breeding a horse and a donkey gets you a mule. And mule are, mules are stubborn. You ever heard stubborn as a mule? But mules are also very sure-footed. And so this mule was David's mule. And since you can't ha make a mule, so to speak, in Israel legally, it was a foreign import. It was a foreign imported <laughs> mule that would have been specifically David's. And so when Solomon rides in on this Ferrari, everybody knows, <laughs> right? Everybody goes, whoa, he's riding David's ride, right? He's, and so it, that's, that's a part of what he's doing here. Then verse 34 actually is really specific as well. It's something that is very rare, but we have listed here the priest the prophet, and the king, all in one verse. And that's just an interesting thing. The priest, the prophet, and the king. And the way that God designed the priest, the prophet, and the king was there to always be three separate people in each of those roles. Kind of like, every once in a while, there would be, be a priest that was prophetic as well or something kind of like that. But he did it on purpose for this kind of power struggle thing that could end up happening. But also, he did it on purpose because it points to there is one who is our priest, our prophet, and our king. Who is it? Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can rightfully, lawfully fulfill all three of those roles. So that's just an interesting note, something to think about. But then he says in verse 35, then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be the king in my place for I have appointed him to be the ruler over Israel and Judah. And it's kind of like David is, is wanting Solomon to be sure of who he is. And there's a parallel for our lives. God wants you to be sure of who you are in Christ. And he provides everything you need to have a sure reality and security of who you are in Christ. You're his, you're his child. 
And you will sit. Now, if you're you're Christians, we are going to rule. Peter says we're going to rule as kings during the millennial reign of Christ. So we get to see some awesome things. But you are valuable. You have a purpose for your life in Christ. You're a child of the king. And God wants you to know it. Just like David is saying, I want you to know it, Solomon. Because there's going to be a day when you step into this place and you're going to need to know who you are. There's going to be a time in your life when you step out on your own or whatever it is or into some new venture and you need to remember who you are. You need to be sure of it. You need to know who you are in him. Okay, let's keep going on. Verse 36. Did we read verse 36 yet? Okay, verse 36. ben Hanai, the son of uh, Jehadiah, answered the king and said, Amen. So I agree. May the Lord God of Israel... I'm sorry, may the Lord God of my Lord, the King, say to, say so too. As the Lord has been with my Lord, the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my King, of my Lord, King David. And so Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Ben-Haniah, the son of Jehodiah, the Cherethites, and the Peleothites. So these were like, remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but those were like, the secret service, those were King David's like right hand, his guards, his men. They went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule. So we got King Solomon's right hand men, Sol, I mean King David's right hand men riding there, walking alongside David as he's in the foreign import and took him to Gihon, verse 39. And then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they blew the horn and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. Verse 40, and all the people went up after him, and the people played the flutes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth seemed to split with their sound. It's a loud sound. Verse 41, now back to the other scene. Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished eating. And when Joab heard the sound of the horn, he said, why is the city in such a noisy uproar? And while he was still speaking, there came in Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest. And Adonijah said to him, come in for you are a prominent man and you bring good news. And then Jonathan answered and said to him, no, (laughs) I like that. No, our Lord, King David, has made Solomon king. And everyone went, right? Verse 44, the king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Ben-Haniah the son of Jehodiah. Let me just really quickly. You guys remember who Ben-Haniah was? Wasn't he the general or the military? Military guy. He was one of the mighty men who killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. You guys remember that one? Which is like bad right there. He also killed a valiant Egyptian man, a warrior. He, he, he's, just, he's one of those guys that is awesome. And uh, I don't have enough time. I want you to take note of him because later on we're going to see something that is awesome. God keeps using his life. But Anyways, uh, Ben-Honiah um, of Jeho- Je- Jehoadiah, the Cherethites and the Peleothites, and they have made him ride on the king's mule, verse 45. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon, and they have gone up from there rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. This is that noise that you've heard. Also Solomon, he sits on the throne of the king the throne of the kingdom, sorry, verse 47. And moreover, the king's servants have gone to bless our Lord, King David, saying, may God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. And then the king bowed himself on the bed. So we got David, he's kind of bed-stricken, bed-ridden. He bowed to Solomon. I mean, kind of giving that authority, that's pretty awesome right there in its own right, this old timer that can't move very much makes it a point to say Solomon is the king and he bows before uh, uh, Solomon on his bed verse 48 and also the king said thus blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has given one to sit on my throne this day while my eyes see it 
So all the guests who were with Adonijah were afraid, and they arose, and each one went on his way. Stand up, get the jacket. You know, I think my mom's calling me right now. Dinner's ready. And I just ate and spoiled my dinner. She's going to be so upset. So verse 50, now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. Now let me just give you a little perspective. Solomon, Adonijah's, I'm guessing 20s, late 20s, early 30s. Solomon is 17 years old as he gets ready to take the throne of Israel. And Adonijah, older brother, is afraid of Solomon saying, indeed, Adonijah is afraid. For look, he has taken a hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. So he runs to the altar, and he grabs the horn. It's kind of the, the horn's kind of the idea of, like, ollie ollie oxen free, home base. You can't hurt me here because I'm holding on to the horns, and I'm in this holy place, which is kind of a common thought in that Middle Eastern culture, but really not in Israel. No, because God's a God of justice. And so the priests would actually take you out to stone you. <laughs> like, come on, I know you're trying to hide here, but let's go. We got to execute this sentence because God is righteous. And what you are doing isn't. So anyways, he goes pleading like, I have the horns of the altar. It's kind of like an old Western, right? Where the guy, he goes to hide in the church. You ever seen those? And they're like, he can't, you can't get me. It's a, what is it called? Sanctuary, Sanctuary right? I was going to say safety zone. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Those are the safety uh, videos from work, right? Safety zones. No, okay, whatever. But anyways, so that's the idea. And so Solomon at 17, and I, man, I really wanted to get into the next section. I'm not going to be able to get there. I'm sorry, guys. It was so good for the youth, but I had them stay in. Hopefully you guys heard some of the word and got fed tonight. Anyways, verse 52, then Solomon said with this wisdom of a 17-year-old, if he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of him shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So, King Solomon sent them to bring him down from the altar, and he came and fell down before King Solomon, and Solomon said to him, go home, right? Go to your house, get out of here, and, and that's what happened. Uh, he went home with that warning, and we're going to see next chapter. Do you think he was someone who would heed the warning? Personally, he, when he, he doesn't heed the warning, and I gave it away, and I'm sorry, but one of the things that you see there that I really think is he was, he was getting at was, you're 17 years old. You're not going to kill me. And then he died. <laughs> I like that. But anyways, what, what we were going to see with Solomon, no, I don't like that he died, but what we're going to see with Solomon is that he is a man, a 17-year-old of his word. It's so awesome. He does everything he says he's going to do. He's an upright teenager. I mean, he's someone to strive to be like, right? It's, it's an awesome thing. Let's all stand together and let's pray. God, we come before you and we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for who we are now that we know you. God, I thank you tonight that for those who know you, we can be right with God. We can know that we're not on the wrong side. We can know that we're not frustrating God. We can know that we're right with him and it's not by doing a whole list of works. It's by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. By faith you have been saved. By faith you have been saved. And not, not even just faith, but by faith through, by grace through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift from God. Thank you for the gift of our salvation. And that all we have to do is accept it and then allow you to change our lives. Allow you to work in us. And we find what David found that we looked at at the very beginning. That we love to be in your presence because that's where the fullness of joy is. That's where our pleasure is fulfilled in you. And so we thank you for that, God. God, I pray that you'd be with us as we go out, Lord. 
Make, help us to be bold. Lord, help us to be, help us to not be fearful, Lord. But I pray that you would, and this is that weird disclaimer I don't really like, but help us to be safe, Lord. Help us to be safe and to care for others and have love for other people in this season and in this time. God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. 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 God bless you.